Everybody thought Bournemouth were going to get relegated this season, but somehow Gary O'Neill managed to do what many considered the impossible job and keep Bournemouth up with games to spare. And how exactly did they do that? Well, it hasn't been easy. At the start of the season, Scott Parker was in charge and he did really well to get the team promoted in his first season in the Championship. But in the Premier League, as you can see from this squad, it wasn't exactly what you would expect a Premier League squad to be in terms of the quality. Bournemouth basically carried a Championship squad into the Premier League. You look at the likes of Fulham, Nottingham Forest, they significantly bolstered in key areas. But Bournemouth essentially had to play a back five with a center back or central, mid central midfielder in Jefferson Lammer in there. And the tactics were very basic and it didn't really allow Parker to create a very expansive style of play like we saw with Bournemouth in the championship. And Scott Parker wasn't really happy about the lack of investment in the summer. And after the 9-0 loss to Liverpool, he essentially threw his players under the bus saying, I feel sorry for the fans. I feel sorry for the players, to be honest with you, because at the moment, we are just a bit under equipped at this level from where we have come from. The players need help. Today proved too big a challenge. The levels were far too big. At times we couldn't bear it, the intensity. So as you can see from that, a lot of short sentences, which generally means that he's holding back from what he actually wants to say, and he's pretty f***ed off. Unsurprisingly, Parker was sacked after those comments, and in came Gary O'Neill, who was Parker's assistant, and he was hired as the interim coach. And under O'Neill, as you can see from the tactics board here, he had Bournemouth in a more back-to-basics back to approach, in a 4-4-2 slash 4-4-1, mid to low block, and the emphasis was in a similar way to go direct, but with Billing playing here just behind Dominic Solanke in somewhat of a second striker role, uh, he, could, his, he could link up with Solanke in a similar way that he did at the championship. And the main aim behind this and behind Gary O'Neill's tactics was to steady the ship because Bournemouth had conceded 16 goals in the previous three games. And this was a starting 11 they used in Gary O'Neill's first game as interim uh, against Wolves. And it was a boring nil-nil, but it's exactly what the Bournemouth fans wanted to see in the sense that the team was very compact uh, didn't let Wolves to get into dangerous areas. And this worked well initially as Bournemouth went six games unbeaten in Gary O'Neill's first six games as interim. But during the World Cup break, remember that, that was quite a long time ago, Bournemouth struggled to score goals and prevent them, which is not the ideal combination you'd want from a Premier League side. And then we get to the January window, which was the perfect time for Bournemouth to make all the reinforcements that they were unable to make in the summer. And those signings significantly improved Bournemouth's attacking options, which basically meant that O'Neill could coax a more expansive style of play with a more talented group to work from. And some of those signings we've got on the board here. So Matthias Vina, signed on loan from Roma. We've got Dango Watara, who is a tricky winger, signed from Lorient. We've got Hamid Traore, a creative midfielder from Sassuolo. And we've got Antoine Semenu here on the bench, who is a promising forward signed from Bristol City. And these signings essentially allowed Bournemouth to play more fiercely on the counter with some really fast attacking breaks with the likes of Watara, Solanke and Vina making those darting runs in behind on the counter. And in the example we've got here, the opposition in a hypothetical example are playing a high line. And let's say for example, Jefferson Lerma, as he does so well, wins the ball in the middle of the pitch. Now, immediately after that, you will have the likes of Solanke dropping just here between the lines. Uh, you have Billing dropping off as an option as well. And Lerma will play this pass to Billing and then quickly to Solanke. And just as he does that, He's got the pacey Watara, the likes of Christie on the other side, Vina even coming in to help out the attack, making those runs in behind. And obviously they made these runs before they're in offside positions. But the idea is Solanke with his hold up play, his combination of strength, his balance, his ball control, and his ability on the half turn, he can either turn and dribble into space or play these passes in behind to Watara or Christie and Vina on the other side and the likes of Billing and everyone else will get in to help as well. And once you have Watara in this advanced position here, in behind the defense, he can play these square passes, these cutbacks into the box for the likes of Solanke, Billing and Christie and whoever else decides to make that run in. And this has quietly become quite the trademark goal for Bournemouth under Gary O'Neill. And there have been quite a few notable examples as well. And this is one of them from Bournemouth's 1-0 win over Liverpool, where Philip Billing got the only goal of the game. And in this example, Bournemouth win the ball in their own third, and Adam Smith, the right back, spins a ball down the channel for Watara to chase, in behind Andrew Robertson there. And you can see he's virtually in behind the team. You've even got Virgil van Dijk, who's a centre back, coming out wide, vacating his position to try and chase down Watara. And he doesn't end up getting there. And you can see that van Dijk has still vacated his central defensive area. And notice how Dominic Solanke charges the box as a traditional striker would. But I want you to pay attention to Philip Billing here because he times his run 
just after the first wave of retreating Liverpool defenders, which is key. And just as Billing angles his run into the box, we can see Watara is angling that cut back just behind Konate and Alexander-Arnold there. And the result is Billing basically having a shot akin to the penalty spot. And he converts his shot with his weaker right foot just before Alisson can even make an attempt to save it. Van Dijk is out of position. Robertson caught out as well. One, two, three. You don't really want to count Watara, but basically a lot of players in the box for Bournemouth to make to take advantage of this slick counter-attacking opportunity. And that goal basically shows how versatile Billing is. And for me, he's personally one of my favourite Bournemouth players. I consider him something of a unicorn because he can play as a number six here, as the deepest line midfielder. He can play in a double pivot alongside another midfielder. He can play as an attacking number eight in a box-to-box -box, as he did for much of last season. But this season, under O'Neill, he's been playing predominantly as a number 10, or just as a second striker behind Dominic Solanke, which I feel is his best position. And he's thrived in this role as a team's top scorer with seven goals this season. And it's because of the timing of his runs into the box, the way Bournemouth are able to create these chances, and the way, despite the fact that he's six foot five, is able to ghost into the box without anyone noticing. So why was the Liverpool goal important? Well, it epitomises how quickly Bournemouth have been able to go from one side of the pitch to the other, especially against teams with high defensive lines. So Bournemouth have the fifth highest direct speed in the league, which is a measure of how quickly a team can get the ball from one side of the pitch to the other. And Bournemouth is 1.52 metres per second. And it's no coincidence either. Bournemouth have created almost identical versions of this goal against Liverpool, uh, against the likes of Tottenham, Leeds and even Arsenal. It's simple in its nature, but so, so effective. Now, Bournemouth aren't just limited to creating these cutback chances on the counter. They can do it by going direct against deeper sitting teams as well, as we can see from this example from Bournemouth's 4-1 win over Leeds in April. We start off with Lloyd Kelly here with the ball and playing against a set defence, he sprays a long pass all the way up to Billing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Philip Billing is noted for his height, six foot five, but his aerial ability leaves a lot to be desired. But still, he manages to knock down Lloyd Kelly's long pass up to him in between two Leeds defenders and head the ball down to Dominic Solanke in space just outside the box. Solanke has the ball in his possession and he angles a run around the defence and as he does this, attracts the attention of one, two, three, four white shirts. And from this position, you probably think that a cutback is near impossible but not for Solanke, because he has his trusty partner, Philip Billing, angling a run, just as this Leeds defender begins to creep in as well. And he angles his run to the near post, and just as Solanke gets to the byline, the pass is played back, just as Billing checks his run back across. And Billing gets his shot off, but it's eventually blocked by Liam Cooper. And the ball ends up falling to Lerma, the whole team pushes up, Lerma strokes up to the ball at the edge of the box and curls it into the top corner. It is one of Bournemouth's most aesthetically pleasing goals this season, obviously because of the individual brilliance of Lerma, but it all started from a direct approach trying to fashion those same cutback chances. Now as we can see from this viz here, Bournemouth have created the bulk of their chances this season from just outside the penalty area. And it's a position which Dominic Solanke has frequented quite a bit. Now, former Bournemouth manager Eddie Howe signed Dominic Solanke and noted that he was somewhere between a number nine and a number 10, almost a 9.5 if you will. Someone who has got the abilities of a modern day striker in the sense that he can hold the play up, he's got his dribbling abilities and a decent eye for goal, while also showing some playmaking abilities in his selfless runs and movements uh, and his ability to bring others around him into play. So as we can see from his pass reception map last season, Solanke was Bournemouth's predator in front of goal, the guy who finishes all their chances, scoring 30 goals last season. And while he did still play as a number 10 at times, and you can see that in the amount of passes he's received in the channels, his main aim of the team was to be on the end of chances. But as we look this season, while the change isn't drastic, we can see that Solanke takes a lot more touches in deeper areas and drives Bournemouth up the pitch with his impressive ball carrying skills. Yes, Solanke only has six goals this season, but he's also got seven assists to go with that in a low scoring Bournemouth side. But the key is he's gone from being Bournemouth's goal scorer last season to their provider this season. But back to Bournemouth. Why are they trying to score all of these cutbacks? Well, put simply, those cutbacks generate high quality shots, which generally means just shots closer to goal. 
So as we can see here from Bournemouth's shot map this season, Bournemouth have taken the vast majority of their shots from inside the box, not just that, but quite close to goal as we can see from this 16% mark here. And you may notice that Bournemouth take quite a modest amount of shots per game, 9.6, which is actually the lowest in the league. But their XG per shot, which measures the quality of each shot of 0.11, which essentially means that each shot has an 11% chance of going in or resulting in a goal, is the joint third highest in the entire league. So while they take a small amount of shots, they are very, very efficient with those chances because those chances that they create are close to goal and have a higher chance of being converted into goals. So how did Gary O'Neill pull off the impossible job with Bournemouth? Well, he did it by making the most out of his exciting attacking players, generating those counter-attacking opportunities, which led to those high quality shooting opportunities from cutback chances. The closer you are to goal, the better chance you have of scoring. And the quicker you can get to goal, the less chance the opposition have of stopping you. And with the bottom of the table as tight as it was, Bournemouth only needed to put together a couple of consecutive wins to escape the drop with games to spare. And that's it. That's how Bournemouth did what everyone considered to be the impossible job. If you like that video, be sure to head over to The Athletic, where I've written an article about this very topic called Bournemouth's Great Escape. I've been Ahmed Shubal. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.